Hello, my name is Sam Madigot, and on behalf of the BCCJ, I would like to welcome you to this event titled Hacking Cyber, Securing Your Workplace in the Digital Era. As this is an interactive webinar, we encourage you to send in your questions via the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. This is a topic we actually visited last year and are bringing back as part of our Future of Work series, uh, which is focused on post-COVID recovery and the wellness of people and places. Stay tuned to the BCCJ website for more on that. Since we hosted this event last year, industries have continued to witness rapid transformation, but few more so than that of cybersecurity. As online attacks continue at an alarming pace in Japan and globally, we today seek the advice of what I think you would agree is a fantastic panelist lineup. Today, we are joined by Carter McLaughlin, Chief Executive Officer at Nihon Cyber Defense, Mihoko Matsubala, Chief Cybersecurity Strategist at NTT. John Noble, CBE, Non-Executive Director at NHS Digital, and also Senior Executive Advisor at Nihon Cyber Defense. And moderating today's session, Takuji Okubo, representing the BCCJ's Executive Committee's Digitech Task Force. Before TAC kicks us off with the content, we would like to invite a guest we are delighted to have with us today, Darren Goff. Director of Trade and Investment and Japan Deputy Trade Commissioner for Northeast Asia. Darren, over to you. Thanks very much, Sam. And good afternoon to everyone joining from Japan and good morning to those joining from the UK. And thank you for making an early start. So as Sam says, I'm Darren Goff. I'm Director of Trade and Investment at the British Embassy in Tokyo and also Deputy Trade Commissioner for Northeast Asia, a rather grandiose title. Um, my predecessor, some of you may have known Chris Heffer, um, who I took over from two weeks ago. And I'm very pleased to say this is the first event that I've been asked to speak at since I've taken on my new role. And it's such an important area and such an important issue for both our companies and really uh, both our countries. I'm really pleased that I have this opportunity today. And thank you very much to the BCCJ for inviting me. So let me give a, a little bit of context to uh, today's event. Today, we're talking about evolving cyber threats, how we should be prepared and how we should protect our businesses and our prosperity. And the pandemic has changed things in many uh, different ways. So there's been some real positives in terms of the unprecedented digital transformation that we've seen across all aspects of our society and economies, from flexible working, uh, virtual business engagement, uh, bringing in e-hankos in Japan, online schooling and telemedicine, our lives have become even more uh, dependent and reliant on connectivity and the internet. This also, this brings huge numbers of, of, of benefits, I believe. However, this rapid digitization also created risks. It's created opportunities for cyber criminals and malicious state, state actors to target vulnerabilities in our networks. And we've also, during this pandemic, seen increased and more sophisticated cyber attacks, from phishing to significant attacks on supply chains and the devastating impacts that they bring on our economies. And in particular, ransomware is becoming a key threat to the global business community. So in order to fully embrace the new possibilities brought by digitization, we must be vigilant and active in our efforts to ensure robust cybersecurity for both our businesses and our assets. So let me say a little bit about where the UK is on this. So the UK identifies cyber attacks as a tier one national security threat. So really high priority. And we've invested over 1.9 billion pounds to develop our cyber security capability during the course of our strategy, our national security strategy, which lasts from 2016 through to this year, through to 2021. And as many of you will know, this included establishing the National Cyber Security Center in 2017. And this is central to our work in combating cyber threats, providing a portal for communication between both the government's cyber experts and also business, academia, industry, and wider society. Today, the UK's cyber expertise, I believe, is truly world leading uh, with the largest cyber security sector in Europe and, and having actually five new cybersecurity businesses being launched every week. 
And in total, uh, in our thriving ecosystem, we have 1,400 firms focused on cybersecurity and 19 academic centers of excellence in cybersecurity research. And our aim is really to be very joined up, bringing together government, industry, and academ academia to work closely to drive innovation and develop the skills and the regulatory frameworks that we need to keep our cyber system uh, and our cyber resilience as world class. But we can't do this in isolation. Um, so the UK can focus its, on its priorities, but we need to recognize the international nature of cybersecurity. Cyberspace doesn't recognize national borders or national boundaries. So a cornerstone of the UK's approach to cybersecurity is collaboration, close collaboration with our international partners to build mutual cyber resilience uh, to protect global cyberspace from adversaries. And I think um, the UK and Japan are natural partners in this. So um, during the 2020 Olympics, uh, we were working closely with uh, Japan on uh, dealing with cyber threats. And, and that partnership, I think, needs to get even stronger uh, across a range of different areas moving forwards. Japan and the UK are very like-minded in their, their approach to technology and cybersecurity. Uh, they're very technologically advanced nations. Uh, and there's lots of kind of shared interests and commonalities between our two great countries. So um, we're committed to further strengthening our partnership with Japan in cybersecurity, and we want to ensure a free, open, peaceful and secure cyberspace that will underpin both our nation's future prosperity. We believe businesses are key to this. So we believe businesses in both our countries will play a vital role in, in this by sharing their expertise, and by building innovative partnerships um, uh, together. So we're further promote industry partnerships between the UK and Japan. And with the UK-Japan free trade agreement that was signed last year in record time, this provides a really good framework for future collaboration and future joint working. So to sum up, today's webinar provides a, a really fascinating forum to share knowledge, expertise, and ambitions for the future of cybersecurity. Let's continue to strengthen our partnerships between our two great countries in this vital area. And I very much look forward to the rest of the event and to working with you closely in the future. Thank you very much. And I'll now hand over to Takuji Okubo to take through the next item. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And thanks for the uh, great introduction to the, to the event. Uh, so my name is Takuja Okubo, uh, and I'm, it's, a it's a great pleasure and honor to uh, re uh, represent uh, BCCJ to moderate this event. Uh, the, the, the rest of the panel, uh, we have uh, 51 minutes. Uh, it will, will be more, mostly divided into two parts. So in the first part, we will talk about um, uh, cybersecurity and in particular ransomware uh, as, as a focus topic. And we will be talking about more of a general uh, trend, what's happening in the last uh, five, 10 years, why it should be one of the top priority for you. Um, so that will be the first part. And we will have John and Mihoko give us the initial remark uh, on, on this topic. And in the second, and then this will get us to about uh, 5.35. We will be spending about 25 minutes on this. And then we'll move on to the second part, uh, uh, starting off with Kautan to discuss uh, more of a micro issue. So if you are, if you are responsible to, for your organization in securing your cyberspace, and uh, what, what are the uh, key issues you need to think about in advance to being attacked, and what are the key issues uh, to do, what to do, uh, if you realize that you are already a, a target of a cyber, a cyber security threat or in particular ransomware. So in the second part, we will be spending about 20 minutes. Um, so uh, so bo in both part one and part two, uh, audience, uh, you, uh, we have uh, opportunity to pose a questions or comments to, uh, to the panel. So do feel free to put in your questions or comments in the Q&A boxes. And in the second part, um, if, you, if you felt that you had a questions uh, in the first part, for the first part, but you kind of missed the opportunity, you could still put in your questions uh, regarding what we discussed in the part one. 
Okay, so you have uh, two opportunities to put in your questions, and uh, it's it should be a great opportunity for you to uh, you know pose your uh, uh, questions to the you know, to the great panelists we have. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, move on to the part one, uh, and we have uh, John to start the start your initial remark. Please, thank you. Thank you, Tak. Uh, thank you, Sam, and also thank you to the B. BCCJ for inviting me. I know you've got a tremendously um, committed membership, so it's great to be here and to be um, talking at this event. Um, Darren mentioned the in, in his introductory comments about National Cyber Security Centre, where um, I was the director of incident management, and my, my team dealt with over um, 800 serious incidents. And since then, with NIH on cyber defense, um, I've dealt with a number of major cyber attacks, and most of those have been ransomware. So I want to go in and, um, and draw on that and really talk about three things. I'm going to try and explain why, at a global level, um, we're seeing this thing, the, an increase in both the, the number and impact of ransomware attacks. I secondly wanted to explore what I think are the key technical controls that, that need to be thought of um, by organizations to prevent the attacks. And finally, I want to go and cover um, what I think are the most um, important areas by way of preparations in case you do experience an attack. And then Carton's going to build on some of this with some of the lessons um, in part two. So starting with, you know, why has there been such an increase in attacks? Well, I think the first fact is going to say, obviously, you've heard, you know, we are much more now digitally reliant. So there is a, a much bigger target area. But arguably, the biggest change has been in the, the business model adopted by the groups who are carrying out these attacks. Um, we, in effect, now have ransomware as a service, where some groups, a lot of them based in, in, in Russia, are developing this, this, this ransomware and are then making it available on leasing arrangement to other groups. We also have a second set of groupings of those who identify vulnerabilities in their um, in, in victims and again sell that access on to the third group who are the groupings are those who actually carry out the attack and so to give you a sense of the global scale of that you know many of those um, those groups carrying that are now based in Africa in, in Nigeria for, for example so you've got something which is truly international um, but it's also relatively secure these different affiliates as some people call them all have trusted relationships and that allows them to collaborate and it's added dramatically to the number of groups who are involved in this act activity. Um, I think it's also worth emphasizing that I'm afraid organizations are paying. So this is seeing this people are making money out of this and so that's just feeding the machine and that's why we've got this increase. But it's not just the number of attacks, there's been an increase in the impact and that's because the attacks are more sophisticated. The attackers will seek to disable the backup to, to make um, recovery extremely difficult or, or even um, impossible. Um, they will spend time within the network identifying data that they can go on to steal and then threaten to expose the sort of double extortion technique. So these are people who, will, who are using very sophisticated techniques to increase the pressure. And I think that's one of the factors why we've seen so many organizations being left with no choice but to go and, um, and pay. So in terms of, of, of the technical preparations, what, what, what must be done? Well, I think the thing I want to emphasize is if somebody tries to sell you a solution to everything, then I'm afraid it's snake oil. There is no single solution. This requires both a, a strong emphasis on cyber hygiene, getting the basics, you know, getting the um, uh, making sure that software is up to date, make, making sure that the authentication systems are there. You know, having multi-factor authentication is extremely important. But I think to this audience, particularly with multinationals, there's, there's also worth emphasizing the importance of having network segmentation. It makes absolutely no sense to, to, to have a network which is completely flat. You know, compromise of one of your subsidiaries could end up being compromising the whole of the organization. So I think there, there are a number of measures, and, and, and I know Nihon Cyber Defense so, you know, um, emphasizes some of that in the advice that we give that you should be looking at to carry out. But um, 
I think also, I think it's, it's, it's worth exploring a little bit more detail. What are the other preparations that you need to, 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 to think about? Um, and so when I look at some of the attacks, what, what have saved people? Well, the first point to make is the importance of having a backup and a backup which is truly offline and is protected. And absolutely crucially, it's that 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 is the testing. And if you can't at least test the backup, because I know that can risk some business continuity, then you must at least tabletop um, to, to go through what would you need to do. So by way of an example, I've recently worked with a large European multinational um, who experienced attack. They had to rebuild from their um, their tape backups, which is often that, what, what, what happens. Um, but they had to basically get the manual out for the for the tape backups, and um, there was a real shortage of expertise to help them to go through that process. And it's that sort of thing which is really really important that you you have you have workshopped. I think another key preparation is is that of having an incident management plan, being very very clear about who will do what. Um, and again, Carton will explore some of this later when we see what is good and what is bad. And there's a very big difference between those companies who've had an incident management plan and those who have exercised it as well, because you really, really must make sure that people understand their relationship and their, their responsibilities. And an exercise is very important. And that should be done at different levels, at a board level, um, a tabletop, um, right the way down to the information security professionals. Um, and, and as you'll hear later, very important that we're, we're exercising not just the technical remediation, but also how we, we mitigate the, the impact on, on, on business. We also see that the lack of a business continuity plan in, in many of the incidents can be really, really, really important. Cyber attacks are going to really do stop a business working. So you have got to thought, think through how can you manage those, those, um, those, those impacts? How can you allow your business to, to continue? So thinking, thinking that through and again, exercising it, making sure it's up to date, making sure it's a, a plan that is lived and, and everybody in the business is bought into is very, very important. So I want to go and sort of summarize my, 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 my comments on, on where we are. There has been a dramatic increase in, 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 in the number of attacks and, there, and it's either across sectors, it's across countries. It's everybody's going to be a problem. There are preparations that we must do to stop an attack, but also we must prepare in, in the event of happening. And that in, in that way, if those preparations are carried out, it's going to make it far less likely that you're not put in a position of having to pay. Because if you do pay, you're basically feeding the system and you will be just encouraging more attacks. And we really shouldn't be doing that. I'm going to pause now because I know we're going to go and hear now in a moment a little bit more about how this is all impacting within Japan. Thank you so much, John. Uh, so I do have questions for you, but uh, let me uh, let's let's uh, hear it from Miyoko. So who and it would be great if you could give a more focus overview on what's happening in Japan, Miyoko. Sure. Thank you for having me. So um, so so thank you, John, for your excellent presentation. And I'd like to highlight uh, two major cyber threats uh, during this pandemic. The first one is a cyber espionage on the social media, and the second one is ransomware attacks. So why we see so many news on ransomware attacks or cyber espionage or cyber attacks in, in general uh, during this pandemic? So as John already explained, uh, we are more reliant on digital platforms like WebEx or Zoom, but we are not necessarily well aware of cybersecurity best practices. So why? Because NTT actually found out, and it is astonishing to learn that only 53% of uh, global companies have provided cybersecurity awareness training for their remote workers, even though that most of us are still working from home during this pandemic. And it is also shocking to see that 
38% of remote workers have uploaded their work-related data to non-work-related applications, such as Facebook. Isn't that scary? So, and we are really anxious to know about the latest information about the pandemic, uh, geopolitical tensions, and uh, trade issues uh, around the world. So that is why the clicking ratio to the ratio to click phishing or spear phishing emails skyrocketed during this pandemic. The ratio was less than 5% before the pandemic. But you know what? After the pandemic started, that the ratio actually jumped to over 40%, more than eight times higher than before. So that is why we are more vulnerable to cyber attacks, including ransomware attacks. And Microsoft found that 41% of our global workforce is now interested in, in their, um, switching their job within the next 12 months. Because during this economic downturn, uh, thanks to this uh, pandemic over the uh, more than 12 months, uh, many people have been unfortunately furloughed or laid off, and people are more you know, spending more time online, and they are more interested in switching their job. But now it's a prime time for hackers and cyber espionage people. And this April, the UK government warned that over 10,000 British citizens have been approached by a foreign spies or organizational criminals uh, on LinkedIn to steal either national secrets or uh, trade secrets related information. And some of the information they are going after is related to COVID-19 pandemic or a treatment or a vaccine information. For instance, Last fall, what happened was North Korean hackers uh, sent uh, phishing email, phishing messages on LinkedIn to AstraZeneca people to try to steal information on COVID-19 vaccine information. Fortunately, it didn't work out, but sometimes cyber espionage won. For example, uh, three years ago, a Chinese company uh, reached out to a Japanese engineer and I tried to, 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 to try to say like, hey, let's uh, compare our notes. And because the, the Japanese engineer was working on our latest information on smartphone related technology, and the Japanese engineer, unfortunately handed over a trade secrets on uh, smartphone related uh, latest technology. And the trial is now going on in Japan. And because we are now more reliant on social media, including uh, Facebook or LinkedIn to, for our uh, and personal branding and also and our, and switching the, our job. So we have to be really careful and we should pay extra attention to potential cyber espionage to try to, to go after our business uh, relationships and also the information we have on the latest uh, technology or national security. And the second threat we should be also worried about is of course uh, ransomware attacks. And uh, CrowdStrike found that 52% of Japanese companies have been either attacked by ransomware attacks or a ransomware attack over the last year. So more than 50% of Japanese companies have been uh, attacked by ransomware. So why? Because it is partly because that the remote workers are not very well aware and pay attention to uh, potential cyber attacks, but also uh, we are not doing our good job about cyber defense because Sophos found that only 23% of ransomware attacks have been prevented before encryption started. So it means that three out of four ransomware attacks would be successful to disrupt our business operations or government uh, works. So it is not good. And so we really need, really need to start working on to raise um, the awareness of cybersecurity 
among remote workers, but also among business leaders and government leaders to raise and uh, enhance our cyber defense. And as John explained, we are not very good at uh, uh, cyber hygiene, but also not good at uh, preparing for potential disaster by cyber attacks. For example, NTT found out that only 52% uh, uh, of companies in the world don't have any planning to, to pre pre prepare for potential cyber attacks. And that actually happened to Colonial Pipeline in May when they are hit by a, a massive ransomware attack. They didn't have any disaster management plan to prepare for a potential ransomware attack. So what we really need to do next is to first to uh, raise our awareness, but also to enhance our global cybersecurity governance. Because interestingly enough, most of Japanese ransomware attacks uh, are coming from uh, subsidiaries outside Japan because Japanese companies have been investing more in the global market because of the, the shrinking market in Japan due to the, the aging society. So, so some of the major ransomware attacks uh, happened outside Japan, for example, Capcom, a uh, major Japanese gaming company, and also Shionogi, a major uh, pharmaceutical company in Japan. So it means that when it makes more sense for Japan and the, um, the UK to share cyber threat information to mitigate on any potential damages caused by cyber attacks because some of the cyber attacks are coming from uh, Japanese subsidiaries in Europe. So um, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that the two countries have been deepening and also expanding our relationships on economy, security, and also, of course, a cybersecurity through the very successful Tokyo 2020 Summer Olympic Games and uh, the security relationships and the trade. So I really excited to see this uh, successful uh, expanding relationship between the two countries. And I really look forward to do working closely with you and my uh, Japanese and British friends on cybersecurity in the future. Thank you. Th thank you, Mihoko. So we have about six to seven minutes for the uh, question for the part one. So quick, quick question to John. Um, so in terms of a global trend, um, what I understand is that, uh, you know, cyber hackers are becoming, I mean, black hackers are becoming more and more sophisticated, well-organized, there's even, you know, a division of labor. They also came up with this idea of, uh, you know, ransomware as a service. So it does seem uh, there's a kind of a arm race going on between uh, uh, hackers uh, uh, at cyber criminals and also people who are uh, basically yourself you know security professionals but uh, from you know management point of view uh prevent you know it's it's really a cost right it's uh it doesn't directly uh help your uh, your sales so it's really a cost to the company and you know uh, from management point of view we don't really like this arm race you know, like uh, hackers spending more money, more resources into hacking you and the company having to spend more money into defending themselves. I mean, where does it end, uh, John? Well, I think we could spend the rest of the time on the seminar trying to, to answer that wide ranging um, 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 question. I, and I think it, it ends in that there is, there is no, there is no sim, single answer to this. It needs action by government. And we start to see that with some of the, the efforts the US has put, for example, to put pressure and, and the UK as well in joining, putting pressure on, on Russia to act against some of these criminal groups. It also comes to some of the large technology companies to be building products that are secure by design. And certainly, you know, that's one of the approaches that we've got, we, we've got to go to, that there are vulnerabilities here which are decades old, which are being exploited 
by hackers and they really really shouldn't should not be there so there's something about the country but there's also something we've got to accept that if you're going to do business online you do need to invest in the right security controls and there's and as always there's a balance between security and and you know usability making it all work and cost well probably we're not getting that balance right at the moment if we're going to you know there's phenomenal benefits as darren has brought out from digitalization but it comes with a price, and if you don't, if you are not prepared to pay that price, then then you've got you've you've got a risk. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, John. Um, so Mihoko, uh, so I do have more Japan specific question, but uh, can I actually answer the same questions from Japan's point of view? And what the reason I'm saying is, you guys are security experts, right? So. More, you know, emphasizing more resources is fine for you, but the, for the management point of view, you know, we, we do need to, you know, we have to have a, we, we are fine, you know? Okay, we will find more, we will spend more resources, but then what if cybersecurity becomes more emboldened? And, uh, you know, how long do we have to keep increasing uh, security budget, Mihoko? So what we really need to do is to have a risk management committee at the board level. Because none, of course, cybersecurity is so important, and especially to me as an, I work on cybersecurity on a daily basis. But none, the headaches that none, the c suites are having is not only cyber attacks. They also have to about the pandemic, also about the terrorism, and, 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 and trade confliction between the United States and China. And others. So, so you know, what you know, successful companies are doing is they, they are having uh, at least you know, monthly uh, risk management committee meetings at the board level. And they are inviting not only uh, cybersecurity and the CISOs, but also CIOs, uh, chief uh, risk officer, and, um, and uh, tax management, and uh, human resources. To, to list up you know, 10 uh, top uh, risks they are dealing with. And then they co compare notes and like, okay, so we have this amount of budget because they are not, don't have limitless uh, amount of budget. So they have to prioritize how to allocate their limited amount of budget to top 10 lists. And if they think that, okay, so we are actually in a good shape uh, in terms of the cyber risk management, at the moment, so we should spend more money on the pandemic. Or they should say, oh, we actually are a little bit behind uh, to, to deal with ransomware attacks, so we should invest more in cyber hygiene or this uh, incident management. Okay. Uh, thank you, Miyoko. So uh, for the audience, uh, I do encourage you to put in your questions. Um, I actually do see one question, but uh, for that uh, question, I I will uh, try to, we will try to answer that in the second part because it's a question of what to do if you are, you know, SMEs. Um, my last question uh, in the first part uh, to, uh, to actually to Mihoko first is, look, Japan is in a kind of a special area where, you know, it's kind of, when, when it comes to international issues, it's, you know, we can't really use force abroad, right? So in the in the incident uh, United States suffered earlier, you know, there, there are talks that the uh, US seems to have retaliated in sovereign, you know, in foreign, uh, for, foreign soil, in attacking cyber criminals who are outside United States. I think Japan, Japan police, Japan uh, defense uh, will find it very difficult. Do you think this, this actually uh, uh, makes it very difficult for Japanese public sector cybersecurity official to deal with uh, these international criminals? Mihoko? So there are you know, several options available for any government in the, in the world to, to respond to uh, cyber attacks, either from the government or from uh, criminal actors. So first one is, uh, to uh, take, uh, to do a strategic communications, uh, naming and shaming, to say like, hey, so, so this is the, the, the state sponsored actors or criminal group that are gonna conduct this type of cyber attack against uh, these sectors. So we are now responding 
on the, we, we, we are not very happy about this. And the second one is more aggressive to uh, impose uh, economic sanctions or no, no, indicting uh, those uh, actors. Or the fourth uh, one is to uh, go a little bit extreme to take military actions against those actors. And so, so far, Anna, as far as I see the public, uh, publicly available information, Japanese government has been really prudent to choose uh, on uh, options available. And they have already um, uh, named uh, specific uh, state-sponsored actors or then also then the cyber criminals uh, then on specific uh, massive cyber attack campaigns. And uh, but now because the Japanese government is releasing a new national cybersecurity strategy later this year, so I really look forward to you know, you know, how the Japanese uh, responses will evolve in the future. Right, thank you. So kind of similar question to John. So I think uh, this cybersecurity really give uh, bring the, 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 the concept of an international criminal organization or transnational criminal organization, uh, another big uh, you know, focus. So yes, there has been, you know, mafia, et cetera, who have been operating across countries, but then cybersecurity, I think the, the phenomenon is it's, uh, it's multifold. So, and I guess it does require kind of a more international coordinated response. John, do you see that happening? So I think that, you know, ideally, yes, we would like that. We would love to have a treaty which bans, you know, certain criminal things, it, 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 but I, I don't think we get it signed and I, you know, people have got different ideas of what criminality would be and I, I don't think it would be effective. I think the most important thing is, and we've already heard about this, is, is how we share information. Okay, this is a business. Okay, so these people build infrastructure to carry out the attacks. When you're compromised or somebody's compromised, there was a whole load of data about that infrastructure. If you share that rapidly across different companies and different countries, they have to get rid of that infrastructure and new, use new ones. Um, and so that's why it's really, really important that we share effectively between countries, as we heard in you know, Darren's introductory comments. If we do that, we can drive up the, 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 uh, the cost of it. There are also some national level um, um, initiatives. We've got one in the UK called um, um, Active Cyber Defence, which allows us to, to share reports from the public about how they've been the victims of crime and then share that with everybody else and block action to malicious sites. I think it'll be these sorts of initiatives which will actually start to change the cost benefit um, things. And that's the only way to really tackle criminal, criminal groups. Thank you very much, John. So we are already running a bit over time. Uh, so let's move on to part two. But uh, again, for audience, uh, do, do feel encouraged to put in your Q and A, and we will be we will definitely come back to your questions before the end of this panel. So, uh, so in part two, so Karta, more practical uh, tips for you uh, from you, you know, preparations, what to do if you actually attack. So uh, the floor is yours, Karta. You're on mute. Everyone, thank you very much, and thank you. Uh, Matt Barris and John are very valuable points made and, and uh, it's good to have you here today and thank you very much to the BCCJ and, and uh, yourself TAC for, for moderating today. So first of all start with some of the challenges that you know one would face in a ransomware attack and some of the, basically some differences that you might see. Obviously a ransomware attack raises a lot of tension within an organization and it's a tension that needs to be managed properly. Uh, ransomware attack by its nature is, is, is probably an interactive cyber attack and the fact that it also uh, is an ongoing cyber event with the, with the attackers negotiating with an organization around the payment of a ransom. Obviously, it's a severe business disruptor for any organization and it severely affects the business operations. You know, it can be very technical and that the technical side of things is often a big challenge for the decision makers of an organization to understand in order to triage 
the particular events happening around it once and where it happened. Uh, the root causes can be difficult to understand because, as John mentioned, and Miho uh, Matsubarasan mentioned, that there are complex attacks that have that have been taking place over a long period of time, and and to understand all of those root causes can be difficult for any organization as well. You know, computer forensics, which is, plays an important role in, in, in incident management of other forms of cyber attacks, can often take so much time that it's beyond the time given by the ransomware attackers. So that is a little bit different to, to things as well. You know, and the recovery times are mission critical to obviously your business operations. And, and there is a lot of time lost through fear and uncertainty around these types of attacks. So I guess it's, it's, it's all boils down about to figuring out what to do. And, you know, NCD and uh, Neon Cyber Defense has, uh, has dealt with a number of major attacks against Japanese corporations, ransomware attacks. And, you know, we, we've kind of got highlighted some things, not complete list, it would take me too long today, but some of the things that, you know, can go badly or go well. And, and I guess the go badly is that, that oftentimes there can be, no one seems to be in charge, or at least if some is, someone is in charge, it's, it's placed entirely on the, on the CISO as a technical issue. And uh, oftentimes it leaves the CISO in a very, very lonely place. And it's not seen as a whole of organization problem. There's also the underreaction or, or, or often the optimism bias. Well, it'll be okay. Let's just see. Let's just see. <laughs> but as the clock ticks by and the time runs out, there's, there's a possibility that you will not have all your data returned even, or, or the ransom attackers may move on to the next victim and you've lost everything. You know, poor communications undermine the confidence in any organization. And we see that all the time in, in these types of attacks is that different departments and or parts of the organization are not communicating well. And last of all, the contingency plan doesn't exist or, or is completely ignored in the crisis or the emergency that is taking place. So those are some of the, some of the bad points. Some of the good points is the whole organization is involved. The CEO, the CIO, the CTO, the CAO, the board of the organization is involved. All the decision makers have accurate information in an understandable way in a timely manner because it's the organization that makes the decisions around this. You know, there's an effect of comms within the organization and stakeholder management. And, and it's all about control. And John, I'm sure, will, will put push this point across as well, about the control that is maintained throughout all of this. And, and sometimes control leads into the possibility of bringing in what we will call a critical friend to the organization. And, and I'll talk about the critical plan later. You know, there has to be a plan. There is a plan. It's been rehearsed. It's been updated with new forms of, of cyber attacks, like ransomware. Yet three years ago, if you had a very, very nice, well-rehearsed uh, incident response plan, and you hadn't dealt with a ransomware attack or, or a new variant of a cyber attack and updated that, then you would be at a loss what to do. So it needs to be, it's a continual process of doing these things. And, and another last point there is that the, the, the technical side and the management side need to understand each other. That's very important too. You know, oftentimes you don't have time to think and it can often be very helpful to have someone on the team who's gone through this before. And, and you'll see that the most successful uh, incident management side of things and ransomware attacks is that they've brought someone in who's been through it before. So, and a very key point of all of this is also to look at the lessons learned after a ransomware attack. You know, you need to reduce the risk of the potential of another cyber attack. You need to prepare for a possibility of another cyber attack. You need an improvement plan. Uh, you know, you need to create uh, updates to your incident response and your business continuity plans. And, you know, obviously one important aspect is, you know, you, there has to be a larger role for corporate communications. 
And we have done this in the past with Japanese companies and, and, and John, is a, John is very good at this uh, and some of the other members of NCD as we go through what's called a lessons learned exercise. And, and that would be a definitive account of the incident, an evaluation of the incident response, an improvement of the capabilities, identify strengths and weaknesses of your partner incident response companies or, or teams around it, and obviously a review of the forensic side of things. You need to identify the root causes of the attack, the short-term measures of how to block a similar attack, and the, and the development of a short to mid-term plan around improvement. And uh, last of all, just to say, you know, it's all about having an effective, resilient plan with the proper responsibilities assigned to each person. And lastly, I just covered very quickly the importance of a critical friend. You know, it's a, ransomware is a complex intera interactive attack. You know, the board of a company needs objective, timely advice, immediate access to guidance. You know, it needs help on the control side and control, as I said before, is critical to the success of the triage of a, of a ransomware attack. You need to take pressure off the board so that they can make the right decisions and someone who can have an independent viewpoint. And, and it's all about, and John, is, John and, and some of the other NCD members are experts on asking the right questions. And, and if it's possible, I'd like John just to cover that, asking the right questions very briefly. Okay. Have we got time, Tech? Um, yeah, could you could you give us John? Could you give us like one minute answer to Karatan's question? So yeah, I I think it's about having how you you put the right amount of challenge into the process, so that you are asking all of those difficult questions of the technical teams. You are um, making sure that, that all of the measures that that need to be taken are, um, and that this is you know going back to Carton's earlier point. This is not something which is just left. With, 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 with the CISO. These events are incredibly stressful for the leadership of, of an organization. Um, if they're not stressful, then they're probably not aware of what's going on, if I'm honest. Um, and, and that's why having a sort of third party to go and help you or you know, somebody who's been through this before can be really, really important. I hope I haven't gone over my minute. <laughs> Thanks so much. And actually, uh, so still um, staying with John. So I think you have, a, we got a question from Phil, Phil Robertson. Um, again, one minute's answer, please. Uh, any specific anti-hacking themes for small businesses? So it's a great question from Phil because small businesses are the majority of the targets. So it's really important. And whatever else you do, go to ncsc.gov.uk and there's a specific guide for small businesses. But, but I would like to sort of emphasize, do four things, please. Firstly, have multi-factor authentication. A password, even a complex one, is simply not secure in 2021. The second area, the administrator who looks after that is the person that the, the attackers are after. Making sure, make sure you understand the rules about how an administrator behaves and making sure they are properly protected. If you protect them, the, the attackers cannot get to the rest of the organization. Thirdly, keep the software up to date, the cyber hygiene points. And finally, have a backup and make sure it's genuinely offline, that backup. If you do those things, you'll make it extremely difficult for somebody to compromise you and they'll go on a tax another small business so don't give up do those things and have a look at the ncsc guide for some more detail yeah uh, could i could i add something yeah, we, go, go ahead we obviously see that that's a huge issue for small companies and 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 there are restrictions on budget etc so we actually in seeing the number of attacks escalating in japan we created a, a ransomware portal that, that will take you through that and offers help and advice. Uh, and it's in English and in Japanese. Okay, Th thank you. And staying with Kaltan, uh, would you answer the question from Mr. Bearworth? So how can organization assess how safe our digital infrastructure really is? Obviously one uh, answer could be, well, hire, hire you. But uh, other than that, uh, what can how can organization CEO have a kind of broad view of how safe you are? 
Well, you know, so, I mean, uh, my first question would be, and I often ask this, uh, have, have they gone through any kind of vulnerability assessment or penetration testing? Um, that's, that will give you a, a fair idea of, your, of the state of affairs of your organization. And, and often it can be the first step to look at things for, for companies. Mm, okay, thank, thank you. Great, so we have four minutes. So there's one very interesting question from Kylie Lowe. Um, and I think I'd like to go to Mihoko for this question. If you if you are if you are prepared to answer for it, um, if you if you actually have no compliance the against to answer this, um, so how did Tokyo twenty twenty manage to be more or less successful without too much you know incident uh, cyber incidents, Mihoko? Yeah, thank you for your question. So uh, I, I think it isn't an overall and uh, collaboration uh, success uh, between uh, the, uh, Tokyo 2020 key stakeholders and also critical infrastructure companies and also uh, the previous uh, summer Olympic Games uh, host countries, uh, including the UK. So I, I think that uh, risk management uh, in general, plus uh, pandemic risk management and uh, cybersecurity uh, preparedness on the really helped uh, Tokyo 2020 to be successful to avoid any uh, major uh, disruptions to the operations of Tokyo 2020. Okay. So I recommend that. Thank you. Uh, John, Kartan, do you have any, any views on uh... How did Tokyo 2020 manage, or did it actually manage uh, to keep the lid on uh, cyber incidents? So I think that, and I go back to the geopolitical side of things, you know, and obviously I think it has a direct effect on the number of cyber attacks that we may have, may or may not have seen against uh, the Tokyo Olympics. Um, it would have helped. I think it would have helped the fact that, uh, you know, we've got the Beijing Olympics coming up soon as well. And, uh, and there was a lull in the geopolitical tensions uh, around the Olympics too. And as we saw also, the Russian teams did quite well, even though they weren't under the banner of Russia, they still did quite well in the Olympics too. So the only thing I was going to add is, you know, say well done, obviously, to, to Tokyo for hosting a fantastic event, but also those involved in the network defence. You know, mm. clearly people have done a really good job in defending it. We, we did some work helping some of the main infrastructure suppliers in advance, and this was taken really seriously, cybersecurity by, by Japan, and that will have been a factor, as well as ones that Carlton mentioned. So hats off to Tokyo. Yeah. Great, and, great games. Yeah, and NTG... And so I worked a little bit with NTT and some of it, and NTT did a very good job in hardening a lot of the systems that were developed uh, for the Olympics, because uh, basically I, they, they would have monitored what was happening there. So NTT did a very good job around it too. Well, th <laughs> thank you. So, okay, one last question. Um, so, well, I think the question is basically, is there any risk? to bringing in younger, less experienced individual into cybersecurity team? Obviously, the more resources better, but is there any risk? I, do we have to be careful in bringing in you know, newbies into your cybersecurity? Um, maybe John or Mihoko, John? So there's a risk in not bringing them in. There's <laughs> absolutely not a risk. You need diversity. In, 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 in cybersecurity, it's so important. You know, it's, it, from, from a gender point of view, there's not enough women in cybersecurity. You know, the reason we've got cybersecurity problems is because so many men are involved and we all think we know everything, but um, we also need to grow um, the, 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 the cybersecurity experts of the future. And that's certainly something the UK, we're really putting an emphasis on, and I'm sure in Japan, it will be the same. We can't, if, if we don't bring in young talent, we will, we, will, we will fail at, at, at this. Yeah, I mean, METI, METI, the Ministry of Trade, basically, they, they, had a, they commissioned a report a few years ago, and they felt that Japan lacked approximately 200,000 security professionals. So we need to fill that gap in Japan. And if we don't, then we'll just leave ourselves, you know, a, a huge gap and a huge target for, for, for corporate Japan and public sector, of course. 
Thank you. So I, I wish we had more time. I actually had a few great questions I wanted to ask, but I, I will you know, uh, restrain myself. Um, so um, I will hand this over to David, who would have a concluding remark. But before I do that, well, let me thank uh, all the panelists and uh, audiences uh, for the great questions, comments, and uh, contribution to BCCJ. Thank you very much. So David? Thanks very much, Tak. And everybody, um, as ever um, here at the BCCJ, our goal is to create trust and opportunities um, for our members uh, and stakeholders by sparking a dialogue around the most important and pressing business issues. And I very much think with a great panel today, uh, I hope you'll agree with me that we managed to do that. Uh, Darren very eloquently said at the beginning that cyber security is a tier one, tier one national security threat. Um, and I think we've learned through the conversation that this is really a business problem. It's not just a technology problem for the chief information security officer. This is a business problem that needs to be dealt with um, you know, at the highest level by the board of directors involving uh, CEO and the rest of the C-suite. Uh, we obviously need to protect ourselves against the threat, but I think we also need to be ready to uh, respond and recover uh, in response to those, the consequences that can arise. And by doing this, we can make our organizations resilient. And I think by being resilient, that's how you can build trust and loyalty with your stakeholder group and your customers, which fundamentally is what business really is all about. So this is hugely, a hugely um, important issue. Um, with that, I mean, please uh, let me echo tack by asking you to uh, thank our panelists today. Uh, first of all, for to Darren Goff for opening uh, Carlton, McLaughlin and his tremendous team at Nihon Cyber Defense, Mihoko Matsubara, John Noble, and uh, Tatak as well. Thank you very much for facilitating. Um, and also let me thank the audience today as well. It's your participation in these forums and these events, which uh, you know sparks that conversation and I think really leads to the value. And I hope that everyone will continue to follow up on this topic by checking out additional resources on the BCCJ website. Um, with that, let me just encourage you to join our next event, which is on Monday, the 23rd of August, uh, which will be the one day to go event to the start of the Tokyo 20, Para, 20, Tokyo 2020 Paralympics, when we'll be welcoming Dr. Mark Bookman from the University of Tokyo. Um, and let me just end by wishing you, thanking you again today and wishing you all the best for the summer. Please stay cyber safe and COVID healthy. With that, have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much.